the most important thing for learning any of this stuff, for real life learning it, is having a monstrous spectrum of people that both can and cannot, most importantly, cannot do what you think you'd like for them to do. And everybody wants magic. We want, we are like walking magazine covers. We want the three steps to flat abs. So we want the three steps to teach a squat, the four steps to fix or whatever. It's like, oh, grow up, man. This is not Sesame Street. There's more than one or three things, you know? Welcome to the Exercise is Health podcast. Where we're talking about exercise, health, and the interconnectedness of the two. We are your hosts, Charlie and Julie, and we will be coming to you every single week from our studio, Muscle Activation Shawbrook. Hey, welcome back, everybody, to the Exercise is Health podcast. We are your hosts, Charlie and Julie, and we're coming to you from our studio, Muscle Activation Schaumburg in Schaumburg, Illinois. Now, at Muscle Activation Schaumburg, we believe your health is your most valuable asset. Your health is one of the biggest influencers of the quality and quantity of time that you have. And while there are many aspects of health, our expertise is exercise. Exercise has been proven time and again to not only improve your health, but also increase your longevity and improve your quality of life. And today, we have a phenomenal guest for you, none other than the developer of the RTS program himself, Tom Purvis. Tom has been educating personal trainers nationally and internationally since 1989. Trainers entering the field in the past decade probably have not yet heard of Tom. In the past 15 years, he has dramatically reduced his travel commitments to focus on a few long-term projects as well as life. Nevertheless, his monthly classes at RTS, the Resistance Training Specialist Program, are regularly sold out, every seat occupied by only the most committed and forward-thinking trainers, therapists, and specialists from around the world. Former IFBB pro Ben Pakulski has called Tom the Yoda of resistance training. Tom is who the professionals seek when they are truly serious about training others as a legitimate career choice, not just a default job. His students are committed to taking responsibility for individuals' idiosyncratic needs and making client-defined decisions. They build exceptional businesses, especially with clients who are physically compromised in any way. Tom, thank you so much for joining us and welcome to our show. Thanks, guys. Yeah, appreciate you inviting me. Oh, absolutely. We are really excited about this. As a lot of you guys know, we in our in our exercise podcast, we refer to the RTS program mm-hmm. or when we say, oh, when we go to Oklahoma or when we bring up Tom Purvis, this is the Tom Purvis we're talking about. So exactly. you're going to hear from the man himself. Yeah. So, Tom, kind of take us back. Wait a minute. I got to go back and clarify. You said <laughs> you said you're so excited. When are you not excited? That's a fair point. <laughs> that really doesn't mean a lot, Charlie. This is like your normal state of being is excited. So, but thanks anyway. <laughs> That's a very fair point. <laughs> and they all know that. So, you know. It's absolutely true. Well, Tom, take us back to kind of the beginning of, of when you started getting into exercise, when you started getting into training, and kind of how you developed that into a career path for yourself. You've been to my gym and up there by the... In front of the cardio stuff is an old York barbell set. So that's what my dad used to work out on in the garage. And I was about eight, and he made me a little short barbell, you know, so I could do stuff. But then about, I guess it was like 13, I grabbed his stuff and started getting kind of serious about it, at least for that school year. Mm-hmm. Then you get off into other stuff. And anyway, I think I was about, you know, when I – Soon as you kind of, relatively speaking to everybody else, start um, getting some strength, mm-hmm. start looking athletic, whether you are or not, whatever, all the coaches start going, you should play football and you should wrestle and all that stuff. And my problem was I hated coaches because I, they are, this, this is going to end up being a little piece of my puzzle with trainers today is so many coaches were just scream at you to get you to motivated. Really, they were just trying to freak you out and not really great teachers. Mm-hmm. Now, you know, that's I think that's pretty much exclusive to coaches at a certain level because obviously you get your Vince Lombardi's or whatever, and uh, mm-hmm. not that I would know, but they're good teachers of lots of things, depending on whatever their specialty is. And there was a wrestling coach that was awesome and was not Mr scream to fire you up but very in your head type of thing and i really appreciated that and i kind of came to all that stuff late in life but uh or like high school and not junior high and ymca like everybody else but but that was a cool thing to see what a coach could be like 
to see what kind of thing I needed to be encouraged, not just like intimidated or whatever the heck. But anyway, I think I got turn 16 and the old closest gym was about 15 miles away. So we drive down there every day after school and all that stuff. And that was still hit and miss every, could do a couple months, miss a couple months. And then the day I started college, I was like, all right, I'm either going to do this or I'm not. And I never missed another day for like 15 years, which is probably not good, but <laughs> you know, pendulum swing too far the other way. But, um, but it, you know, and, it, and it got, I didn't really know there was anything with bodybuilding. There wasn't anything with bodybuilding. And I, I thought it was cool and I liked it. And nobody really did it just to be in shape back then. You know, there weren't, there weren't giant fitness centers. There were little Nautilus places and stuff like that. It certainly wasn't mainstream at all. And bodybuilding itself was a weird, weird culture, subculture. You know what I'm saying? Now, there's a million Everything well, back back then they put the contests in muscle and fitness, which is mainstream-ish now. Mm-hmm. But they put the nationals in muscle and fitness in the the heavyweights. There are only seventeen of them, right? <laughs> so you're looking you're looking up the ranks. You're going, I could beat that guy someday. I could beat that guy someday. And then by the time I got to where I was thought I was about ready to compete, I think there were 752 guys in every class, you know? <laughs> and you're like going, well, you know, if we had a time machine, I'd be pretty kick-ass in this stuff, but it's not happening. <laughs> and there was, I had some level of success in that. And it's easily, people don't like it when you say this, especially if they're, if they've achieved something in it, but it's 99% genetics. I'm sorry. I worked out with guys who didn't do crap and they were just awesome. And there are other people just killed themselves. And I'm going to tell you, one of the reasons after winning a couple of things, I just I knew I wasn't going to go any further. It wasn't. It was either take a ton of drugs, and even then, I wasn't sure drugs aren't going to make calves. I mean, you know what I'm saying? So, you know, people just don't realize that. Oh, I need, I need to work harder. It's like, well, yeah, if you're not doing anything, you need to work harder. But if you're already about to tear everything apart, then anyway, uh, sometimes drive and ambition aren't always sometimes it's too much mm-hmm. you know and when you're tolerant of it it's okay True. as long as you can recover from it and everything but then it, eventually people never want to hear this eventually it catches up you know mm-hmm. and that's the fun thing it's like all these guys that i knew that were awesome and pros and stuff eventually they're more broken than i ever was mm-hmm. you know um, so that's that's a really interesting side that nobody ever wants to hear and anyway um but there was a cool lesson when um, two things that really hit me. After I won the state thing, and I had been out of physical therapy school for a couple of years, and I hurt all of, well, I can't say all over, shoulders and knees. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> so much so that within about six months of winning, I, uh, I don't think I could bench press 135 without it just killing me, you know? <laughs> Because you just push through it for so long, and eventually you're just like decline, decline, decline. Sure. And front squats were always my favorite exercise, and it just got to where yeah, I'd have to lay off of those for six months, and I'd get back for a while, and it was great. But anyway, it was a great day, a great uh, awareness when I feel like I'm a wreck, and I've got stupid trophies, and I've got a stupid diploma on the wall and a state license, and people ask me questions, and I'm like, I obviously don't know. <laughs> I wouldn't feel the way I feel, you mm-hmm. know, and I don't know, it, you know, you might had pretty good legs back then, but they're the things I didn't have to work on. So yeah. how can I offer you, it's just such a fraud-oriented thing where the parts people always ask someone about are the parts that they don't have to work. Mm-hmm. And they, they still give advice. They're so hypocritical. You know, oh, I do this and I do that. Or more depressing, I don't do anything. I knew a guy whose calves were so awesome. He was a cab driver. Wow. He had easily the best calves that I'd ever seen. Any of the pros, I moved. That was another, uh, besides all that awareness, there was this, I moved to California. I was done competing. And I thought, I just want to move out there. And I just want to spend every day working out at the Golds. Mm-hmm. I just want to do it because I'm never going to do it again. You know what I mean? And that was that was when back then, 86, there were only two pros that didn't work out there. 
Because if you were going to compete, you flew there from wherever in the world, at least for a few months. But Lee Haney had just gone back to Atlanta and Rich Gaspari had just come back to New Jersey. But everybody else was there. Wow. And it was it was bodybuilding. It wasn't fitness crap or anything. So and there weren't there weren't a lot of egos mm -hmm. like, you know, there's somebody you've seen in magazines over there. And, you know, you're he walks over because you're doing shrugs in the <clears throat> squat rack. And he goes, hey, can I do shrugs with you? And you're like. Uh, I can leave if you want. He's like, no, just keep working. You know, so you just, you know, and their routine was like clockwork. So if you're in there at seven on Thursdays, you were the shrug guy. And okay. then, I mean, it was really interesting. But um, the one thing I thought, I thought, I'm going to move out there. I'm going to learn all these secrets. This guy with great arms, what's his secret? And I don't, I should have known this, but number one, they all did the same thing. Mm. If not today, at some point, they'd all done this or that, and nobody did just one thing. So it doesn't take much scientific understanding, or I should say understanding of what makes science science, to figure out that you want to blame your biceps on a concentration curl, but you did seven other exercises today. Mm -hmm. How does that work exactly? Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, well, I'm pretty sure out of the 5,000 different things I ate today that mushrooms made me sick. It's like, what are you talking about? Are you on drugs? <laughs> but it was that kind of stuff, you know, and that's what filled the magazine. Well, magazines weren't even, that's one of the funniest things because those guys, there's a couple of them that were brilliant and could write and all that other stuff. But those guys, they just took pictures of them, wrote the articles for them. And everybody's following them like it's the Bible and stuff. And it's just really weird. But that was another great lesson. Number one, I didn't know what I was doing. And number two, the place I went to learn it all, they didn't know anything either. Mm -hmm. They knew less than I did. <laughs> and people go, how's that possible? I got to tell you, I learned to have zero respect for someone because of the way they looked. Mm -hmm. And I have to do, you know, the, you do the disclaimer, and I make fun of people for saying this, but a lot of them were really nice guys. Mm -hmm. They really were much to my surprise, actually. And they all had little ideas, this plan, this is why I am the way I am. But they never show me a picture of your parents. Oh, oh, now I see where you got your deltoids. Holy crap, your mom looks like, you know, a gorilla. <laughs> those were great lessons. And the biggest thing that in the middle of that was when I actually started to have a glimpse of what I needed to. So I couldn't work chest for months and shoulders hurt. And so I went in the, I went in the gym. And I think I actually told this story on a video the other day and shoved it up on YouTube. But it really was the beginning of everything. It's kind of like that necessity is the mo is the mother of invention kind of thing. So it's like, okay, I'm going to sit here and see what I can see. I just so I went in the gym, and well, also I didn't do anything else after work but go to the gym. So if I wasn't going to work out, where else would I go but to the gym? <laughs> yeah. So I was sitting there on. There were you know everybody every gym has a thousand bench presses stations, but you know benches, barbell bench press. And a direction I'd never looked, you're always standing over here at the side, you're watching people, you're standing over them, spotting them, you see all these different angles, but I, there were some incline presses behind, and they were facing the other way, so there were spotter stands, you know what I mean, mm -hmm. that were more, the, that were at the face and the, the spotter stands were closer in the direction of the bench press. <clears throat> so I sat down on one of those, and I was looking at the head end of a bench press mm -hmm. from the, the picture that I draw. Mm -hmm. And some of my first slides even were that attempt at showing that. In fact, that I put a bunch of that stuff. I think old, 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 19, like 90 NASM mm -hmm. stuff I was trying to draw. It was terrible. Overhead projector. Nobody knows what that is, you know. And I was watching it, and I started noticing there was a really common theme among people, the most people walking in a bench press. And most of them were built my, like me. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter tall or short, but they're relatively thin rib cages. And if someone would, someone would occasionally look at my go, you got a thick rib cage. I said, well, compared to you, but compared to the people <laughs> I care about, I don't even have a rib cage. You know what I'm saying? It's like everything's relative. Yeah. But, um, <clears throat> and and relatively long arms. So, you know, that didn't mean tall, but if someone's five foot, but they have those proportions, they have the same problem because everybody's playing by the rules of take the bar to your chest. Yeah. And so everybody was, you know, way the heck back here in this monster protraction thing and all over the bench. And it was literally like their their chest was up when they were at the bottom and it instantly caved in. You know what I'm talking about? Mm -hmm. Two guys across that three hours, two guys walked in. One of them, I'd known them both for a long time, but one of them was just everybody's hero. He, he, he was ridiculous. When Arnold came to town, he was among a few guys that were sitting out where Arnold, this is like 70, 
seven. <clears throat> and he was among a few guys sitting out at the Hilton by the pool with Arnold. And, said, and Arnold couldn't take his eyes off his arms. This guy had 21 inch arms and all he did was smoke pot. <laughs> you think I'm kidding. Well, I would watch him work out. Everybody worshiped him. I'd watch him work out. He'd go in and for this month, he'd only do calves. And then he'd go in the next month and he'd only do laps. And he'd go in the next, and I'm like, Jay, what is wrong with you? He goes, I don't know. I just don't, I don't know. <laughs> it's, it's crazy. And that's he's another, but he would, he would get on a bench press kick and he weighed, I don't know, 185. And he got up to like 580, something ridiculous, you know? And he'd just come in and sit all night long and he'd go do a set of bench press and he'd sit around and talk to people and he'd go do a set of bench press. And I'm like, I'm not saying that's what people should do. I'm just saying, you know, if you got that going yeah. and you try hard, you probably got a better chance. You know what I'm saying? Anyway, <laughs> watching him from this end, he already had a pretty awesome rib cage, but he was just locked in. You know what I'm talking about? Like the whole. Yeah. And there were, weren't really any power lifters in there. So I never really. Later, I realized that was an important feature of competitive powerlifting, right? Or, or characteristic. But, and he just looked like a machine in and of himself. Like everything was just no wavering, no anything. The only thing that really moved, certainly the bar did. But the thing I saw was the humerus on each side going mm -hmm. from down here to up here. That was it. You know, it's like the elbows just went in and out because the humerus moved. It, it was the first time I could see and see this and we didn't actually have moment arm in physical therapy school we had force angles oh interesting, interesting. And so i didn't have moment arm until i took graduate biomechanics but i could see from that the thing i always try to draw for us in class right with that peck and not just from here but like from here because of the angle of his sternum and the angles of those fibers and i was going okay that didn't look like any of these other 25 people that did this before. And one other guy walked in that did not look anything like him. And he was built more like me, like long arms and like, but he had a thick rib cage and he looked exactly the same. And I don't know if because they could sense something better, they, that's so much of bodybuilding is, is people fall into sometimes in a really good way. Here's what, here's where I feel the contraction the most. Here's what, and that's really kind of a cool thing from, from where we all come from now, the idea of internal function, internal performance, and paying attention to the inside, being mindful. Well, their whole thing is about contraction. Mm -hmm. And you can, you, you know, the rest of the exercise world can say anything they want to about them, but they are, for the most part, trying to pay attention to what's going on inside. And there's something to be said for that. And sometimes that means I'm not going to do that because it doesn't feel good. Whereas the rest of the world is out there going, no pain, no gain to the point of, and you know, if you have to wrap your body in glorified duct tape before and after every workout, you're probably screwing up. Right. You know? <laughs> but those are those were pivotal moments and just everything. And for me, this is part I didn't tell on the YouTube thing. I could not feel where my shoulder blades were. And that's why this sensation awareness, sensory function awareness thing is such a big thing to me, because. You know, if you can tell, if you own your body, if you know where part of your parts are, you don't get that people don't. Mm -hmm. And you certainly don't get someone that, how that changes with age, especially when someone wasn't paying attention in the first place. They don't know if they're standing up straight or they don't know. And so, you know, we, and exercises don't fix what you can't feel. Mm -hmm. So there was a huge, I want to say motor learning, but it was really beyond that. It was a positional awareness thing I had to, and I don't want to say proprioception because people overuse that word and it doesn't mean what they think it means. Mm -hmm. but more of a positional awareness. Where are these things and how do I keep them there? And the, all the things I tried, and you know me, I'm like, I will do anything. I don't care how stupid it looks. And it was really interesting the dozen or so things I tried. And, and I can't, I think it's always a mistake to go. And here's the one that worked because did it work because of the first 10 things I did? Sure. I don't know. But the bottom line is it changed. It, it got to where I could actually, for the first time, years after winning contests, could feel a quote unquote pump in my pecs mm. and no pain simultaneously, no stabbing ice pick in the front of my shoulder. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and, and then I think I probably made the mistake of, well, here's how everybody should do this instead of, you know, looking at and going, you know, there's there's a little bit of there's some adjustment, some fine tuning. What's your goal? Mm -hmm. Does it even feel like you should be doing that? Because if, if not, let's forget it, you know? And that's just kind of maturing in the idea of, yeah, maybe what you're doing is pretty good. Don't get too big, you know? 
Mm-hmm. It's not for everybody. Mm-hmm. But anyway, that's if I was going to look at pivotal stuff and and literally everything else has been like, so let's go look at squats. Let's dissect them. Let's and none of this is like happens in a day. Mm-hmm. It's not like you're doing your homework or your term paper and you come out with this brilliant thing. The most important thing for learning any of this stuff for real life learning it is having a monstrous spectrum of people that mm-hmm. both can and cannot, most importantly, cannot do what you think you'd like for them to do. And seeing some of these people over here, it's like, man, they just, that's this squat thing. Boom. They're doing this person over here. It's like, and then, then you start to go, my God, they're not built anything alike. So add on top of that, a motor learning window of opportunity this guy has. And this guy, he didn't know which way's up. Mm. And as you start layering all those things together, and if a trainer, if a coach, if a therapist, if a whatever you want to call yourself, if you if you can't do that, and I call it protocols, but I don't think, I think I think protocols does it too much justice. They literally can't see idiosyncrasies, mm-hmm. and of all kinds, right? Range of motion, segmental links, all this kind of stuff. And everybody wants God. We want magic. We want we are like walking magazine covers we want the three steps to flat abs so we want the three steps to teach a squat the four steps to fix or whatever it's like oh grow up man this is not sesame street there's more than one or three things you know and so that's the single biggest thing that and ultimately what does it require there are skills of observation there are skills of tempering don't dive in so you you know there's some I always say in class nowadays micro observe but you got it that doesn't mean you micromanage mm-hmm. you got to, it's a it's this exploration process you know but the problem with exploration processes uh, are that if you don't know all the factors that can be manipulated the vast 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 number of factors then you're trying to build a cake with flour sugar and water and you're pretty much done and sure. that's such an interesting I got to tell you, there's so many potential analogies and I probably suck at all of them, but I just envision like the Bruce Lee idea where, you know, it's, it's your, his, one of his quotes about being like water, right? It's like, you're completely fluid in what you're offering and not just willy nilly Mm -hmm. and not because it doesn't matter. It's because you got to find exactly for this individual on a given day, not even that on a given rep, if you will. You know what I mean? Tolerances. And and that doesn't mean don't push, but because you're recognizing tolerances, you see exactly when you can nudge a little bit further. <laughs> and it's it's all those things. And and most people, I really don't think, have a tolerance for what I'm gonna call mastery. And, and you know, you know, that I don't mean a a, a trophy or an endpoint, I mean a, the process. I think they don't really enjoy the process. I think everybody, so many, I shouldn't say everybody. So many people are looking for this. Well, I'm the best trainer. It's like, as soon as you say that, you're an idiot. You're just an idiot. There's no way around it. And I'll prove it. Give me five seconds. I'll prove they're an idiot. <laughs> and, um, and I know how to do that because of all the time I spent being an idiot. Mm-hmm. I have like seven PhDs in idiocracy. So, <laughs> you know, I can expose that stuff. You know, it's, it's just such a big deal. And social media has made it such a mess because the world doesn't know what to listen to or who to listen to. So they kind of, they choose a team. Oh, I like the way that person sounds. Oh, they sound smart. So do politicians, man. We'll see where that gets us, you know, but uh, I had a friend that was saying a brilliant thing the other day. And we're kind of rambling now about trainers and expert exercise professionals, but it's a cool thing that, so we, we, Number one, you can't train somebody online if you haven't trained them before and you don't know what you're looking for. I know some people like you guys, Charlotte Million, McMillan, Jacques, all kinds of people that could probably train people online really well. And it helps, especially if they've worked with them before. Mm-hmm. So they've already been able to walk around them in three dimensions. They already, you know what I mean? Or they, so they're squatting this way or whatever in front of the camera. They go, no, wait, wait, turn, turn sideways. Something might be up there. So they're really still doing their best to see the three dimensional world and they're not just counting reps and giving out, write me up a workout, that kind of stuff, you know. All of these trainers that are watching all this crap on social media, and that's what they're giving their clients, 
You understand they don't need you for that. They can watch social media themselves. The only thing that you have going for you is being in front of them, but then knowing why that matters. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? And they don't know why it matters. They don't know what to look for. And it's not entirely their fault. School doesn't offer that. That's why you get a PhD. And if you want to train, you have to go get a three-day certification. Yeah, right. Explain that to me. Because there's no practical application in the university stuff. Mm-hmm. And if they want to come argue with me, I'll prove them wrong too. <laughs> it's just not a problem. But isn't that that's so true, right? It's like you're a trainer and you're going to YouTube to get tricks and cool exercises to give to your client. Why are you the middleman? They don't need a middleman. I never understood when P90X was a big deal. The gym started doing P90X type classes. Mm. And I'm like, wait a minute, wait a minute. The best you've got to offer, the most you know about fitness is to try to sell something they can do at home and get them to come to the gym for it. It's like, what are you talking about? (laughs) They're going to buy dumbbells and tubing and you're, and you're going to, how you, this doesn't make any sense, you know? Mm-hmm. It's, it's not a good business plan for a play. They need to talk about why this is so much better than P90X, right? Well, let's just let's just right. do it, you know. <laughs> but isn't it the same kind of thing? And trainers just don't. Most of them shouldn't be trainers. Most of them, if they say I have a passion for it, I'd like to know what part of it. That was the thing when I realized. Well, I'm not going to be a bodybuilder. That's for dang sure. Most of the people that were working out at Golds back then that did that recognize that haven't changed much in a while. Whatever, they stopped. They went and did something else. Started riding bikes or whatever. I don't know. And I was like, wait a minute. How do you do this every day for ten years? And then you just go, nah. It's like you. It took so much to show up every day and. And you achieve so much, you just expectations are actually the problem, right? But it was actually the best thing to happen to me because I realized there's no way I'm not coming to the gym every day. And I realized it's it's like that whole chest exploration thing. It's the guts of the exercise that made me happy. It's the guts of anything that makes me happy. Trying to figure out how to build it, how to how to create, how to, you know what I mean? Be it build a house or squat model. And that's that's the only way I know to describe it is I enjoyed the guts of exercise and trying to figure it out. Well, so, Tom, you know that that's something that you've done really well with the RTS program is you know started to take apart like the guts of exercise and teaching people how to see those guts, how to see the variables, and how to implement the the variables of exercise. And you know one one of the things that you said earlier on was this idea of teachers and of how how most trainers today are you know more like motivational coaches like rah rah as opposed to taking a teaching aspect so how do you find that being able to kind of dissect the guts of an exercise at least gives people an opportunity to take more of a teaching role uh, when it comes to working with clients if they are a trainer <clears throat> i'm very biased and i think i'm justified in what i'm getting ready to say but i think it should be the minimum requirement is to be brilliant in mechanics. Anybody, we said, we alluded to this before, anybody can train someone who can do anything. Anybody can train someone from the NBA. Anybody. My daughter, when she was four, could have trained <laughs> LeBron James. Because it doesn't matter what he does. You're not going to make him hit any more three-pointers. You're not, you're not going to change any of that. It just makes you feel good, Right. Let me give you my 100-year-old guy. And you start counting reps. Oh, wait, how much weight are you going to use the first day? You're going to do a one rep max. You're going to take 80%. Are you an idiot? As soon as I confront people with these realities, I got a guy with four patellar dislocations on one side, two on the other side, a hip dislocation. His knee points one way, his foot points the other way. Your NASM assessment is going to mess him up. You're not even going to get in the ballpark with this crap. And you need that assessment because you don't know what you're looking at and you don't know what you're looking for. And until you clean the slate and recognize your eyes are seeing a flat earth, there is no way to do this. And it literally takes wanting to, but then also an aptitude. Mm -hmm. This has been the worst business move, but the most enjoyable thing is having the mastery thing in Oklahoma because it is a big giant filter. Nobody comes here unless they want it. And they also typically don't come here unless they're pretty good at it. Mm Kind of have some version of an aptitude for it. And then if you have those things and you're open to it, it gets really fun. 
because it all becomes a puzzle. Mm-hmm. How do you put all these pieces together? They bring you some broken stuff and people go, oh, we don't do physical therapy. It's like, no, you don't see what's in front of you because there's not a healthy person out there orthopedically. And if they are today, they won't be in two years when you get through throwing tires over. Exactly. Okay. So this, but they don't know what that looks like. They themselves are using Icy Hot, DMSO, ibuprofen, and that stupid tape, and they think they know what healthy is. Mm-hmm. That tape would be cool if they would put skull and crossbones on it. That's the only one I'm going to wear. <laughs> there you Instead go. of a tattoo. Maybe like old sailor tattoos, you know? <laughs> like from World War One, that'd be great. Exactly. Now, Tom, you brought up this idea of trainers when they're trying to be teachers to their clients. You know, one of the biggest things they need to understand is mechanics. And I'd love to talk a little bit more about mechanics and what it is that trainers need to know about mechanics. And I'd love to talk a little bit about internally and externally because I know we talk a ton about that in class and I know when I was when I was in the tra- getting into training and I wasn't sure what RTS was and all that stuff I didn't realize that there could be kind of two worlds here that have to kind of come together to make some kind of not negative storm mm-hmm. <laughs> well m- marketers hate me because I always say what things aren't before I say what they are mm. And they say never to do that. But the problem is I have to address what's already in someone's head, because if you already have something in your head, if they go, if I say, well, it's about X, Y, Z, they're going to go, that's what we learned. I'm going to go, it is not what you learned. It is not this and this and this. That's what you learned. I'm saying it's a, I, I'm, I'm using very esoteric, non-specific examples. But that's the problem is if you ha- anybody already has anything in their head about, oh, I took biomechanics in school. Well, then you're going to be a really tough student because you got to unlearn a lot of nonsense. I did, too. And all I knew, my, my greatest gift is I'm a contrarian. Anything I hear, I assume it's wrong. And I, I, that doesn't mean I'm convinced it's wrong. I'm going to assume that in and of itself, as presented, that's not enough. I need more evidence, but the biggest evidence is with the person that's in front of me today. You know what I mean? Um, That's why I hate supplements. It's kind of a side story, but, oh, this is the best supplement. Okay, every year you're trying to sell me a new supplement. If one of them worked, why would I need a new one? I mean, no, this one's better. It's like the last one didn't do anything. I got to, you know what anything times zero is, don't you? I mean. It's like any exercise program with a name. If it was the best one, we wouldn't have the next one. But mechanics is really, we end up teaching a lot of things that people would find in any biomechanics class in school. They're going to hear similar words. And this is a problem with humans, especially millennials, and all the people that have millennialitis, which is people of any age, is that they hear a word, for example, someone took my manual to their biomechanics teacher, and then when they're flipping through it, they saw the lever system stuff. And they go, oh, yeah, yeah, we teach all this. They didn't read where I beat the crap out of lever systems, Mm -hmm. where I talk about how it has absolutely nothing to do with the human body because we can't change lever systems within us. It is important in building machines, but it's also, as presented in sound bites, wrong. And so, you know, so, but this is so someone goes, oh, well, you're teaching force. It's like, yeah, but if you understood what they taught, this ain't that. Mm -hmm. You're going to hear. For every force, there's an equal and opposite. And I'm going to go, so you're saying nothing's moving in the universe because you can't have equal and opposite and move. Yeah. Net forces can't be zero. Mm -hmm. And they're going net forces. And I'm like, you didn't get net. So all I'm saying is there's, it is not applicable as taught. When they take a physics class in school, it's not physics for exercise. It's not physics for arthritics. It's not, you see what I'm saying? And you took anatomy. Okay. But so you can point to stuff. Like you got a globe and you can go, that's South America. I see Ecuador. It's like, great. So you know about countries? Do you know what it smells like there? Do you know how tough it is to live there? Do you know how much you sweat just looking outside the airplane? I mean, they don't, that's a really big difference from anatomy and understanding how anatomy changes. What happens when these normal changes associated with aging, with, and I don't just mean osteoporosis, but osteophytes and all these things that are in every single one of our clients, probably over 50. Mm -hmm. And 
in some cases can be disruptive of motion and in other cases are just sitting there benign, not doing anything that could bother you and I in our training of them. <clears throat> but understanding that to me, that's where mechanics really starts to, they always talk about forces in motion. I think the key word that they miss out on that I've always included in our um, definition, I reference exact, I can't remember which Garhammer or somebody I reference, that the first word should be structure because it's forces in motion, but what's moving? Right. And what are the forces created by and what are they on? Us. And then we look at skin. We think we're a bunch of skin running and sweating. It's like, no, 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 no. Oh, I know there's a heart in there. I know, but what's the heart servicing? The muscles. And what are the muscles for? To get big? No, they're holding joints together and moving them. They're the little motors. And if they don't take it down and there, now we're to the internal function idea. Because the world just goes and runs. And, well, running is good for you, right? So that's good for my heart. Well, okay, let's hope so. I mean, I'll go along with you there. But a fallout from that's going to be your knees. There's no way around it. Is there anything you can do to mitigate that? Is there, well, yeah, what exercise is good for my knees? Oh, God. I, <laughs> we're done. We're done. This is the single biggest thing. If you've watched the, um, the very first part of the very first class, course, whatever, on that exerciseprofessional.com thing, mm -hmm. is about developing a language. What we're doing right now is talking about the difficulties of even taking a word that has an equation, F equals M, F equals M times A, and still we're not even thinking the same things about it from physics class, right? Soon as someone said the word the exercise, you have a file you open up in your head. And your file has a lot of history. You have a personal sports history. You have a personal bench press history. You have a personal injury history. And then you, somewhere along the way, wasn't too tough for you to dive off and go, oh, wow, the guts of this are cool. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow, they're not just cool, not like a shiny car, cool, but you can do stuff here. You can change stuff. You can mess with the recipe. You can, wow, they're, they're, this drug is really important to them staying alive. Maybe out of the 10 chemicals in there, Maybe we could notch this one down so their tolerance is greater and they actually get more benefit from this thing. I don't just have to throw this same pharmaceutical at them. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And so we're and they're like compound pharmacists who can alter. We're like compound exercisists. Mm -hmm. So we can mess with this thing. And it's not just sets and reps. And it's the least of it is sets and reps. But the mechanics thing headed towards the internal, the mechanics is really the internal function part. That's where that resides, you know, and that's why biomechanics class was so frustrating to me because it's about, okay, here's the center of mass in this gymnast when he's doing a kip. Here's yeah. a, how our soccer style kick, you know, because our kicker at OU back then when they were national champions was a soccer style kicker, Uwe von Schaman. So we were looking at how he kicked and where his foot is versus this and the inertia. Am I going... I don't care what's happening in his knee right now. So that whole idea, and it's really, I just think about this. There's, um, I was talking about the filter of getting here. You have to want it, right? And not just want to achieve something, but want to know and know how to apply. But it, it's kind of that, that same thing. There's so few people who can see beyond what's right in front of them. And then once they go, oh, yeah, there's some cool stuff there, they're gone because it really wasn't their thing, even though they might have had aptitude. So it's a really perfect storm. Yeah. And it also has to do with stage of life. You know, I didn't care probably at certain points in time. And, you know, when you dove into this was serendipitous, right? Some specific things happened. And I don't know, it's a mess. And all these folks out there that just, you ask any trainer, any one of them. I'm, I'm going to go ahead and go out on a limb and be wrong. And I'm going to say, you ask every trainer, why do you do this? And you know what they all say? I like helping people. If you're serious about that, stop screwing them up. <laughs> it's not just about making them happy right now. It's not just about beating the crap out of them and, and exerting your power. It's not just, listen, if someone's out in the parking lot at Gold's and thank God they all closed down, He's out in the parking lot of Gold's over here. I hope they keep the one in California, in uh, Venice, though. They're doing the little boot camp in the parking lot because most of these places didn't have a place for the CrossFit type stuff before all that. So they're in the parking lot, and she's got five 
sorry, stereotypical, out of shape, probably five foot four, 185 to 200 pound housewives, mm -hmm. and they're doing sprints. And they've already done several. And she goes, if you can't finish this, we're going to do five more. And I'm going, you're going to have to explain that to me. Yeesh. You can't finish this one because your body's saying I'm shutting down. And we're going to do five more. What are you, Lewis Gossett Jr. and officer and a gentleman? What is your problem? <laughs> we that's, the, that's the thing, man. And all that's because they're interested in helping people. Mm. <laughs> it doesn't make any sense, but they can't see that. They, yeah. I honestly think that somewhere in there, they think they're doing what they're supposed to be doing. I don't think anybody, despite how much damage they're doing, intends to do damage. Mm -hmm. They either want to be the man, so they're screaming the loudest or whatever. But you know what I'm saying? It's like th there's a giant chasm between what they see and what they need to see. No, definitely. You know, I, I want to build off that a little bit and kind of take it down the the role or the avenue of resistance training specifically. Because I remember in 2012 going to the Missing Link in Chicago. Is it your first time presenting the Missing Link? I remember you writing. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. No. <laughs> No, I, I thoroughly enjoyed it, but I, you know, I remember you writing the, the big sheets of white paper and, and one of the kind of initial questions that you asked was talking about, you know, all these different forms of exercise. You know, we have cardio, we have yoga, we have Pilates, we have sports and, you know, bodybuilding was up there and you said, okay, well out of all these, which ones are actually designed to kind of help the body and, and what what the discussion went towards was bodybuilding because, you know, bodybuilding was at least in part trying to improve uh, or focus kind of like you were saying internally on, you know, what, what's happening with the body and what people are feeling while they're doing the exercise and whatnot. So and we whatnot. didn't say that was necessarily healthy the way they were doing it. True. No, no, that's true. That's a great point. But, but it has, it, I guess it has the opportunity to, to it's promote health. On, to, it's focused to, on this, not the numbers. Right. Exactly. So, I guess taking that idea and, you know, maybe not from a bodybuilding focus, but we'll just say from a more general like resistance training focus, what's the importance of that that you find that people need to be doing, you know, as they age? Because, you know, one thing that's come up a number of times during this conversation is talking about, okay, yeah, people that have, you know, arthritis issues, people that have other, you know, type of joint issues and people whose structures are built differently. And, you know, not once did you, did you talk about, okay, well, you know, they're, they're running form should be this, or, you know, these are the modifications they should be making, you know, when they're playing squash or whatever it was all re around resistance training. So for you, what do you find the value to be in resistance training for people from an exercise perspective? I think those things all kind of tie in. So resistance training is a giant swimming's resistance training. Sure. In the beginning, when I would say this is about resistance training and I start literally aerobics instructors would say, well, I don't, I don't work with resistance. And I'm like, you ever sit on a stationary bike? You know, when you push that little button and it gets harder, the hell do you think that is? Sure. sure. So everything's resistance mm -hmm. um, in terms of, in terms of forms of exercise. The, the big, when I think of resistance training, I am excessively biased. It was that thing you were talking about, the missing link, the two worlds that mm -hmm. actually was about the packaging of exercise. Mm -hmm. But we also talked about the two world, what I call back then the two worlds, right? Bench press is the bar moving to a bodybuilder. Bench press is a chest exercise. To us, it's a shoulder thing with a muscle involved and the bar is going for a ride. Mm -hmm. That is the big shift. I remember doing, I remember the day and the exercise when I actually stopped trying to lift the bar and started trying to, to think about me moving and the bar was just trying to make that harder. Mm -hmm. That's when it became a tool instead of the thing that owned me. And with that in mind, that to me was the key <clears throat> to what became internal versus external focus, internal versus external performance. I use that word because performance is such a big deal. Internal function versus external function. What are you looking at? You're watching the outside. And you're watching a total body thing. Or more importantly, you're watching the sled move or the bar move or whatever you think functional is, 
That's great. That has very little to do with the body. You're hoping and praying, number one, that it stays together, that it's already good. You're hoping and praying that that makes it better. You don't even recognize that it could be messing it up. And I don't mean right now. It could be a long term. There's only so much we can do about what we don't know. Future. But it's such a game. I really I've used this word so much lately, and I really don't mean it to be as demeaning as it sounds, but it's so childish. It is literally little kids games. Like in PE, it's like, let's go play Foursquare. That's supposed to, that's, it's activity. And I used to say that's not exercise. It's all exercise by the definition. That's, there was even a period where I said, well, we don't, then we don't do exercise. We do something else, but it's exercise. It's just, we're focusing on something different. So this idea, let's go to that thing. Number one, it's really hard to argue with this unless you go to, well, I'm going to throw this out there and then I'll start beating it up myself. Everything's about contraction. Everything. Your brain has one primary job. There's a great, on TED, there was this guy who talks about the purpose of the human brain. He's got a British accent, so you know he's got to be smart, right? That's the way that always works. Um, Built-in credentials. Oh, yeah, you're listening to him, you're like, oh, this guy's great. You know, he sounds like <laughs> Dick Van Dyke and Mary Poppins. But, and he's talking about there's one purpose for the brain. And he, he goes, he, st he states it, but then he goes back and says, now we could argue that it's this, we could argue that it's that. And he does this great job of, of it's to generate movement. That's it. Mm -hmm. And people go, what about memory? And what about intellect? And he's like, yeah, but okay. But if you can't move, mm -hmm. you lay there and die. And, you know, it took me a couple of times watching it to go, I wanted it to be more complicated than that. I really did. But the thing is, so people would say, well, the brain is, is what's moving us. The brain, No, it's not. The brain is the computer. What moves us? What holds us still? And I don't even like to say muscle anymore because as soon as you say muscle, people go, I don't want, I don't want to be like Arnold. It's like, it's like, A, don't worry about it. It's not an option even if you wanted it. <laughs> right? But B, that's not what muscle means because you and I are thinking a very different thing. We're thinking tension production. We're thinking cross bridges. We're thinking a whole long list of stuff that and yeah if you think big biceps cool but that's almost like that's the outside part you know but this idea of contraction and quality of contraction and and yes i don't even want to call it strength i prefer to call it as you know output because strength is a matter of torque strength is a muscles the resultant of those muscles and it's moment arm at any given point times the tension production when we're talking about our muscle and contraction it's only 50 percent of what makes you strong but it's the part this is in charge of. The rest of it can't be manipulated. It's mechanics. So when people go, oh, length, tension, and you get stronger and contraction, like, yeah, it's 50% of strength. But it is all about contraction. It's absolutely amazing to me that you can take arthritic joints. If you can find a way to improve contraction, this completely worn out thing with no articular cartilage whatsoever feels better and functions better. Mm -hmm. I don't know how that's possible. But the big mystery was always, it just seemed like such a, a dichotomy of like, well, this guy needs to exercise. What's exercise to a physician? We'll go walk. Well, that's what tore him up in the first place. I'm sorry, but he can't walk. What are you going to figure out? Your job is not to exercise. Your job is to improve contraction. As soon as you get rid of the word exercise, you can start thinking of things way beyond what exercise allowed for. Because exercise is a list of names. So I was thinking about this. This is a fun thing to think about. So, wow, you really, we need to, your feet suck, Mrs. Mm -hmm. Jones. There's nothing, you got nothing. You, you, NASM guy wants you to work on balance, and you're standing on the end of a stilt. There's nothing down there at the bottom. <laughs> right? so you might as well have a peg leg like a pirate. Just go get a parrot, and you'll be okay. <laughs> right? So with this thing has got a thousand joints in it, I exaggerate. Because they're supposed to move and control and micro adjust and all this stuff. It's not supposed to be static and an orthotic. It's not supposed to have this big arch support. It's supposed to move. And every one of those joints has got all these muscles. You need to do, I hate this. This is a physical therapy thing. I hate my, I get to beat up this profession because I've been putting up with my own kind for 40 years. <laughs> Well, we're going to we're going to send you home with some foot exercises. Well, it's just another list of stuff 
that they may or may not do. But most importantly, it doesn't do anything specific. It barely does anything. When they can't do anything, it doesn't do it. They can't do it, right? So someone would say to me, what's a good foot exercise? I actually have only one response, and it doesn't answer them, but hopefully it makes them think, what do feet do? What does your big toe do? And they go, what do you mean? It's like, if I set you down right now, what could you make your big toe do? That's what we need to challenge it in doing. Mm-hmm. But what's an exercise for that? That is an exercise for that. Just watch. Watch this. Make it a little bit harder. Ooh, exercise. Ooh, exercise. See? What's that called? I don't know what it's called. It's called contraction generating against a resistance that's appropriate. So it doesn't tear you up and actually might stimulate change. That's it. We're improving the state of contraction. We're improving tension production. And that's it. If you got to have names, you're done. You're not a professional. You've got to listen. Listen. Sherwin Williams has colors for their paint. Artists don't. Mm. If you can mix any shade of blue in the world, you choose the one that serves the need. You choose the ones that satisfies your eye. In this situation, it doesn't have a name. Oh, it's kind of teal-ish with a hint of that and the other. Sherwin Williams calls it, I don't know, sky in a rainstorm, greenish blue or some crap, right? <laughs> but they got 7,000 blues and they have to have names. More importantly, they have to have numbers. But we don't need any of that. What we need is exactly what this toe can tolerate today. Oh, but you got to move full range of motion. No, I need to do what it can currently do because I'll never get to what it can't unless I figure out how to improve what it can. These are such simple principles, and they, they, they will always elude anybody who's thinking exercise. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Unfortunately, we have no other word for it. I think you, you bring up such a good point, and I, I don't think I've heard the uh, Sherwin-Williams analogy, but similar ones, yeah. you know. What's that? I just now made it up. You just made it up, yeah. I like, I like it because your home improvement goals right now, right? <laughs> well, you know, I'm like outside staining the deck. I'm like bent over on all fours all day. Seriously, because I can't work with clients. But yeah, I, I love that analogy because it, it really shows one of the biggest things that I think Charlie and I have definitely taken away and use all the time from the RTS program, which is, you know, figuring out what what does this person need right now? right now and it's not like oh good because I've been practicing for 10 years now I have 1 million options no it's I have a I have an infinite amount of options because there aren't like pre-filed you know options of exercise you have a cupboard full of spices and you can do anything you want Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so build the tools then you can custom custom blend the difference is it's not just taste it's tolerance Mm -hmm. And appropriateness. And appropriateness is such a big thing. And I say that word, people are like, yeah, appropriate. And I'm like, okay, but do you, do you, have you thought about what that means? Because that means just the right amount of challenge, just the right amount of time, just the right amount of rest, just the right amount of everything. And what do you want from that exercise? So appropriate is goal specific also. Like, listen, I've got, I've got somebody that's learning to move again. It's truly more of a motor learning thing where it's like, all right, let's do four of these and it's getting really hard. That's almost like a four at max. Mm -hmm. Now in fitness, if you're in NSCA or whatever, it's like, now how many days do I have to rest? It's like, we could probably do it again in just a couple of minutes because we didn't wear it out the same way you do. It just, it's your brain. It's your nervous system kind of got worn out. Give it a minute or two. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? It's just looking at it all from it's, it, it, and it also starts mostly with questioning and being comfortable questioning. People Mm -hmm. hate not knowing. It is only recognition that I don't know and loving the fact that you don't know that allows you to seek the answer. Mm -hmm. It's just so important because people will say, well, what do I do? It's like, oh man, I, uh, they just have to have answers. And the answers, you know, you've heard me say this, the answers are all in the patient or the client. Mm -hmm. What was funny, someone actually came to me one time and said, you know, I asked my client what they needed and they didn't know. And I was like, oh man, See, it's, you got to explore to see what's inside of them. They don't know. They just don't want to be there. That's all they know. So, you know, it's just, it's so hard to, um, from my point of view, it's so hard to, to teach people that, well, aptitude's an interesting thing. Desire's an interesting thing. But I just don't, isn't it difficult now that this seems so, it really is easy. When you have a set of principles and all you do is live by those, 
Now, wait, was I supposed to cross the street when the car was coming or when it wasn't coming? And how long is the car about a mile down the road? How long should I wait for that car before I cross the street? It's like, you got to have all these rules, really? Why don't you go ahead and grab mom's hand? Because that's about all you're good for, you know? Tom, as we're talking about this, I'm I'm remembering... Uh, just by my life experience when I was just getting introduced to RTS and you brought up before, you know, how it, it, it always has to be this perfect storm that you find RTS and then, you know, you're in the right headspace to accept it. But I remember uh, working at a crunch gym and literally bawling my eyes out going to work every day because I thought, I don't know what the hell I'm doing at all. And they keep throwing these really difficult people at me like, oh, they came in in a wheelchair, hand it off to Julie. I'm like, oh my God, I don't know what I'm doing. Oh, they have the rare disease, hand it off to Julie. And, you know, I think there's so much value in, in you know, number one saying, I don't know what I'm doing, but I am still in that trainer mindset where I really do want to help people. I do really care. And then, yes, learn starting to learn principles of what do you start doing to take action on individuals when you really don't know what you're doing? Like, I, I had no idea, but now it's interesting because I'm still kind of in that mindset where it's like, I, I wouldn't say, I don't know what I'm doing, but I don't know what I'm gonna do with you today. Or like when people call in and say, hey, so so what do you guys do? You know, muscle activation, Sean Mark, what do you guys do? And what what should we say, you know? Well, we ask your body a whole bunch of questions and we try to match that with your goal and then we try to get you to move forward. You know, and that, you know, as we've already discussed, it doesn't sound cool and sexy. You know, we're not like, yeah, well, <laughs> we're gonna do this cool exercise name. So I think you've brought up a re- some really good points and and, and it's reminded me of my progress through, you know, learning this, learning this mindset, I guess we could say, this thinking process of taking our clients, you know, through this idea of, hey, what can we do to your body to progress it? Which might not mean it's a, it's a pre-structured exercise that you've seen before or whatnot. That's a really, thing we've talked about before is a really big thing. So when a client walks in the door, and ask, what are we going to do? And you're like, I don't know. And they're like going, what do you mean? I was told you were great at this. And it's like, well, do you want the last guy's workout or do you want yours? I don't know what yours is yet. And usually that one sentence, they go, oh, that's interesting. You know, you're not ordering off a menu here. I think a thing that's interesting also, first of all, what you just brought up was something I try to tell people, the single best business decision you can make is to work with the people nobody else, A, wants, B, doesn't know what to do because they think they need to be in a gym. When they go, if you if you, you could never walk up to another trainer or whatever and say, hey, will you send me your, your just send me some folks. They'd be like, what? <laughs> you don't even have to do that if you're willing to take everybody they don't want. Mm-hmm. And the beauty of taking who they don't want is that, they're the most fun to work with because what they need matters. Losing 10 pounds, it's cool. It doesn't matter. Someone going from not walking to walking, that's kind of, that's kind of a bigger deal. Mm -hmm. And so then the next thing, you know, that you, you experienced is, so it's intimidating. Somebody's in a wheelchair. What are you here for? What do you want? What do you, well, they rarely say I want to walk again, but sometimes, but usually there's things lesser than that. I want to feel this. I want to do that. or I want to walk. it. So then what's the next question? Okay. What are your walkers? What's required to walk? Uh, getting out of the chair. What do you have to do after you get out of the chair? Stand and not fall. All that's required before you walk. And people don't get that. Well, functional training, we need to have you walk to get better walking. They can't stand up. What does it take to stand? You know what I mean? And just, and then then you're off and running. Mm-hmm. I'm going to need my gravity fighters. I'm going to need some triceps because they're not just going to stand up without their arms. I'm going to have to get out over their feet. I'm going to have to do all this. It's really, oh, and there's those toe things again we're going to need. It's just not that hard when you start realizing I've got to start gathering up all the ingredients if we're going to build this thing, man. And mm-hmm. if I don't have the ingredients, I got to start working on them first. It's just not that hard. The problem is it falls under what the world calls isolation versus integrated and function versus non-functional, which is what keeps people Functional has become a word that allows you to remain forever ignorant. So, Tom, 
you know, one of the things that you've newly launched, at least, you know, publicly is your exerciseprofessionals.com website. Tell us about that. Kind of what, what's the purpose of it? What are your goals with it? And, you know, if somebody's a trainer right now and they're looking to gain more insight into some of the discussions that we've had today, you know, how can that website kind of start them in the right direction? The big picture is to have lots of contributors, a thing the thing that's launched now is a pretty good chunk of what we're they're calling what they're calling a course library so it's set up like college courses and if you could certainly one of the things i always hated about an rts course courses in general there are a lot of people out there who have heard of what i say with closed chain and we would like to hear it but they don't want to a they're from whatever organization or another profession they don't want them to come for four days to hear the last hour. Mm-hmm. They don't want to jump ship because this is a new team. This is called RTS and I'm NSCA and that's not my team. I might go if my team didn't know, but there's still three days to get to the good part. So that was always something I disliked and just the time constraints of only having three and a half days. You know, and originally there was a science one and then there became a science two. And right, so that doubled in time. Well, even with those, the last time I taught science one, we didn't get to closed chain. We didn't get to joint forces. We didn't get to orchestration. We didn't even get there. And <clears throat> right now, it's not finished uh, because I still want to do a bunch of literature review. Every book and article I've got on closed chain, I want to I want to go through it with people on video. But I've got six to, six or eight hours, let's say six, of closed chain. Wow. It's never been longer than an hour before. But it's when you get to break it down and talk about it and explain, here's what I mean. Let's think about what they might have meant. Let's you don't have time for that in class. Force used to take 15 minutes. It's an hour long video with cool examples and animation and fun stuff. And so what was a total of 56 hours, science one and science two, I'm about two thirds to three quarters done at 120 hours. So it's really funny when people jump in and there's things that like the orchestration section, Charlie, I, I never opened the manual when I redid any of these videos because I didn't want to be influenced by what I thought before. Mm -hmm. I wanted to sit down and go, okay, okay, okay. This is your chance. So many of my updates before were like stick a sentence in here, stick a sentence in there. And it was the same thought process. I wanted a clean slate. What would I, how would I do this now? The orchestration thing became hours and hours and hours. It was always like 45 minutes. It's taken on all this stuff. And and it's really, it's fun when people go, oh, this is such a great review. And I'm saying, great review. There's more than twice as much as there ever was. How are you reviewing what you never saw before? That's really the goal. And it is, it. those things are the fundamentals. Those things are like, oh, this is just school. No, you never learned like this in school. Never once did you hear anything presented like this in school. And number two, My big thing is everybody wants to get the hands on. Everybody wants to talk about advanced in in an advanced manner about exercise. They don't have the language. They don't have the fundamentals. They can't speak it. And if I talk at the level that answers the questions, it goes right over their head and not because it's hard. It's because they don't have a background and it's presented the right way. And that's what all these things are for. This is so we could actually get to hands on and dive in. I don't want to re-explain something that you should know the way you know the back of your hand. You know what I'm saying? Then we actually get to do and not just continually review. And that's really the goal is to, is to have for the people that want to do this is a, an opportunity. I can't, you know, it's what they do with this up to them, but it's at least the opportunity to be more solid in what it takes to actually be, to master exercise, to help people. It's an opportunity for them to be more solid than any other thing I could have ever offered. And it's certainly more than I've ever done because of the constraints of time and flights and stuff. And it's great also because a couple of things, you get to watch it as many times as you want. So if you're overwhelmed in class, you're tired in class, you're sleepy in class, you're going to miss stuff. It was already abridged, you know, and you can watch this over and over and over. Now, the, the thing is you can't write then ask questions and I do not take email questions because I spend all day long trying to write an answer that I could say in five minutes. The other thing is 
people always said, why don't you write a book? A, number one, I don't, I don't think you can learn a three-dimensional moving skill from a book. Mm-hmm. Can you imagine reading a book on swimming and then diving into the ocean? It's like, yeah, you should be good at this now. <laughs> oh, and for all the online classes that don't have hands-on, try to teach t- swimming without some hands-on. Right. I'm just saying. Mm-hmm. But the other thing is, I was always like, but the second it's published, actually, bef- when, it's, when it's in the publisher's hands, mm-hmm. I'm already, it's already old. So the greatest thing about this website, and, it, and it's a bad business decision from a marketer's point of view, but like, like we've already done some of them. You buy uh, whatever, um, strength profiles. Mm-hmm. I'm getting ready to update tomorrow. So you own that and it's in your account. If you had it today, I don't know, maybe by the end of the weekend, the update will be in there. Oh, cool. Very so cool. it's just added. It's just added to that product, if you will. And if you yeah. own the product, you keep getting updates if there's updates made. That's awesome. So, like this, if you bought closed chain and you got the what six or eight hours, mm-hmm. and if I add four more hours of this literature review, yeah, you get all that just plopped into your account. That's awesome. So, and then people are always like, "Oh, that could be upsell. They'll buy that." And I'm like, "I don't want them to have to buy it. I want them to know it. I sure. want them to have it and have no excuse." Yeah, you know what I mean? Yeah. Well, Tom, is there anything that we haven't asked you yet that we should have asked you with this whole discussion of exercise mechanics, you know, the exercise industry right now, challenges that, you know, are a lot of trainers run into um, and that they themselves often present. Is there anything that we haven't touched on that would be, in your opinion, worthwhile to dive deeper into? I don't know. I feel like I already told enough boring stories for everybody. (laughs) That's fair. Well, where can people find out more about you? Where can they connect with you? Where can they learn about your courses? And where can they get more of this information? Well, there's only one way to connect with me, and that's get off your ass and get on an airplane and come here. Because it's so funny. So my personal YouTube channel, personaltraining.com and exercise professional, and those have, those have become the same thing. But um, And then Facebook pages and stuff. At every turn, someone wants to leave comments. On every video, they leave comments as if you're going to answer them. Mm-hmm. And I'm going, you know, I actually have people like right in front of me to talk to that have made a commitment. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? And and the biggest challenge with that is, first of all, it says comments. It doesn't say questions. Sure. It's one of my problems with that, right? Nowhere does it say leave questions. It says comments. Mm-hmm. <laughs> the other, the, the it's the language thing. They ask questions from a place of exercise knowledge or lack thereof where I can't answer it because I'd have to give them a dissertation on how to even understand what I'm getting ready to say. And again, it's not because I'm smart and it's not because it's hard. It's because they're not yet ready to think. It's a different language. And I don't know how else to say it, but it really is. It impairs communication. And that's and if someone's going, no, I understand what the word force means. It's like you still don't know what I mean yet. If you're using the word exercise without quotes around it, <laughs> right? We just don't do exercise the way anybody thinks of. So that's probably the biggest thing. But yeah, there's they can check out stuff. I really think the place to start if someone to your question, if I could ever get back to it, you said to learn more about me. You mentioned TomPurvis.com. I've had it up for five or six years, but it's people are always they're like oh you're a bodybuilder it's like there are so many embarrassing pictures on that thing and by the way guys does anybody have google anymore people don't know how to find anything oh here's a good one for you this is somewhere between sad and frustrating (laughs) a guy sends me an email the other day and he goes this is why i can't do any of that stuff he sends me an email because one of my i have an email address on my personal website okay that I look at once a year. And um, he says, I love, I've watched all your videos. Do you have any online courses anywhere? This was like last week. Mm-hmm. And I go, I wonder what videos he watched. <laughs> and so I wrote him back and I said, where did you see videos? Because he goes, well, on uh personaltraining.com YouTube channel. And I went, that's a good place to start. (laughs) Personaltraining.com. And 
I'm, I'm literally like, and he got my email mm-hmm. off of my website, right. and there's three links down there. <laughs> And all the videos he watched, the, the title of them was clip from blah, 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 blah. And at the end, it says exerciseprofessional.com. I'm like, dude, I'm sorry if this is going to make you feel bad. But if you can't figure that out, you got no business being around. me. <laughs> it's not going to work. We might go to happy hour someday and have fun, but that ain't going to work. Yeah. So if you are a personal trainer um, listening to this, definitely sign up for Tom's classes. They are just, I don't know what to say, life changing in terms of your career. And you guys know me. I hate flying. I pretty much cry the whole time I'm flying (laughs) there because you can't have, you can't even have smooth air from Chicago to Oklahoma. You always have to hit like near tornado Mm -hmm. weather. Anyways, Mm -hmm. it is very worth it. And the hands on piece, I mean, you can't match it. As Tom has brought up, my experience, Charlie's experience, in the traditional education system, you are just not getting any kind of productive hands-on work. So we definitely recommend checking out Tom's classes, RTS. By the way, that's all we have now here is the hands-on. It's just the three hands-on weekends because we've got twice as much as we ever offered for the other stuff before, right? So that's the whole plan is to get all that under your belt and you come here and we're not, even all the the anatomy we used to do on the first day of the body part stuff, Mm -hmm. There's, there's more of that online than I've ever been able to present. The split screen stuff and all the models I built. I don't know if you've seen the chest mechanics model yet and all that stuff. Mm-hmm. Well, good for you, I man. I think I think that's a that's a phenomenal step for you. With the you know, I mean, it's a ton of work to put all that stuff up and re- record it. Well, Tom, thank you so much for for sharing your stories, for sharing your time, yeah, sharing your expertise. I mean, it's it's always a lot of fun talking with you. It's really cool hearing about what's going on now with the classes, and just you know, again, just hearing your perspectives on 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 exercise and on the fitness industry, and on really you know how people need to be worked with in order to be able to kind of keep doing things in their life and and how exercise needs to be a part of the solution and too often it ends up being part of the problem so thank thank you for sharing that well i have to thank you because you know i I got to cancel my uh emotional therapy appointment today because i knew i could just unleash on you guys (laughs) there we go are they even seeing people are they essential i don't know how that's working right now uh well thank you tom appreciate it my friend So there you have it, some phenomenal information from the developer of RTS himself, Tom Purvis. I mean, this episode was so jam-packed with amazing perspectives on exercise, on the role of resistance training in health and function overall, and why it's important as an exercise professional to truly be thinking about what you're doing and exploring all the different variables of exercise possibilities for your clients. So who do you know that needs to hear this episode? Who do you know that is an exercise professional and is looking to take their career to the next level? Who do you know that's working with exercise professional and maybe not satisfied with how their body's feeling and how their body's functioning while working with that professional? Share this episode with them so they can find out more about RTS, so they can find an RTS trainer in their area. And if they themselves are a trainer, they can learn more about RTS. And while you're online, if you wouldn't mind, head on over to iTunes and leave us a rating and review. It helps people find this episode and this content when they're looking for podcasts on exercise and when they're looking for podcasts on health. So if you found value in this conversation today, let us know by leaving us that five-star rating and review. Well, thanks so much for tuning in. We always appreciate it. Have a fantastic week, and we'll talk with you all next week.